continue now with the virtue of trust. Chapter 15 Trust in Desolation The Importance of Desolation This world in which we live our brief lives has ever been for all of us, whether good or evil, whether saints or sinners, an earthly exile, a valley of tears. At every step we meet suffering in every shape. It is, however, a suffering reserved for souls leading the interior life for those souls who are the friends of Jesus. This suffering embraces the spiritual barrenness, numbness, and aridity which we know under the general term of desolations. They are caused by the seeming absence of God and His grace. Those alone know desolation who have known consolation, for those alone know how dull and sad is life without Jesus, who have known the sweetness and the light of His presence. We have all experienced these spiritual ordeals, sighing wistfully for the return of the Beloved. The soul has no sooner crossed the threshold of the interior life and by virtue of the consolations and the proved delights of God, has no sooner in some measure detached itself from this world, than from time to time God hides himself from it. He gives it to taste of the bitter yet salutary medicine of desolation, that he may forthwith detach the soul from the self and from spiritual joys. God's end is only attained when the soul having climbed through the dark storm clouds, has reached the dazzling peak of holiness, and knows at last the unclouded sunshine of its transforming union with God. Desolation, therefore, has an important place in the spiritual life. It is vital that we shall see it in its right perspective, to the end that in desolation we shall order our lives according to God's will. Alas, it is peculiarly in desolation that our trust seems to grow faint. Let us now consider other spiritual ordeals. When we know consolation in particular, it is sweet to suffer for Jesus and easy to perceive in God's crosses the ways of love and to bless him for them. Yet, when faith and love seem to have forsaken our souls, when we appear to be utterly alone, given over to sadness and to melancholy, it is then that the whole face of the earth seems changed. In the dusk and the oncoming night which surrounds us, the merest trifles assume fantastic proportions, take upon themselves the most frightening aspects. Our hearts contract and we are tempted to believe that Jesus has forsaken us, or at least that his love for us has grown cold. The Virtue Which It Brings to Blossom If we make good use of our desolations and of our aridities, how quickly we shall begin to tread the path of perfection! How we shall profit from the inexhaustible treasure of these rich minds! Of loving souls it might be said that barrenness and desolation are a true nursery of virtue. In it, God cultivates with great care, humility, trust, love of the cross, hate of ourselves, perfect love of God. Without the wide choice which we have between various consolations and desolations, we could never realize at all clearly our inherent and essential helplessness. When conscious grace is withdrawn, our soul needs to have repeated experience of its poverty its weakness, and its lack of generosity, that it may reach an approximate perception of its own true nature and of the debt which it owes to God. When in hours of meditation it has felt itself enkindled and enraptured by the power of his love, and when a few hours later it is conscious of ill humor, is sated with suffering, it is made more thoroughly aware of its spiritual poverty than by the best of its meditations. Further, what shall be said of the contrast known to those many favored souls who have known the presence of God and the gift of contemplation? 
At the day's beginning came the joyful hour of dawn, radiant with exquisite light, glorious beneath the morning star, redolent with the perfume of the fragrant presence of Jesus. At the day's end, Jesus has withdrawn himself. The sweet consciousness of his presence has yielded to the desolation of solitude. To the soul, it seems that it has never loved Jesus, and that likewise Jesus has never loved it. All this, nevertheless, is but a trifle in comparison with those terrifying desolations which last for years, and through which pass all souls who are upon the brink of the mystical life, which are known as the night of the senses. The latter, in its turn, bears no comparison with that no less enduring and still more purifying or ordeal which leads mystical souls to holiness, and which is known as the night of the spirit. We shall deal with this at length in a later chapter. Like that holy man Job, the soul finds itself steeped in bitter suffering, for it is this earth becomes purgatory. Moreover, all these, whether they be the desolations of an hour or the ordeals of several years, are the work of God performed secretly in us, which no reflection, no meditation, no resolution could secure us. It is God himself working to give us true and profound humility, who frees us forever from the tyranny of the self, and who once and for all rids us of the folly of pride and makes our own the gifts of the Savior. So only we are wistful of humility. Let us give loving welcome to these blessed ordeals of desolation that a very manure heap of God gives vigorous life to the fine plant of humility. Humility is the elder sister of trust. Therefore, it is not astonishing to see the trust of generous souls grow rapidly in the soil of aridity and of desolation. Souls of poor spirituality lose the little trust that they had. Accordingly, God ordinarily spares them, sending them desolation, but rarely. Yet for the loving soul that desires to manifest its love and its trust in Jesus, desolations are friends. They give it that ability to trust in Jesus, which is its joy at those hours when everything conspires to fill it with distrust. Our human nature is indolent, sad of heart, attracted by material advantages and exterior joys. Jesus seems to concern himself with us no more. It is then that we cry to Jesus, O oh, my beloved, I know that now and always you love me. Now and always I believe in your love. Despite my poverty and my misery, I trust in you. It is your will to see the extent of my trust in you. O oh, Jesus, with your grace, I will endure to the end. Till you shall come to me, I will hold firm to my belief. Ah, these dear desolations of devoted souls that bring to Jesus the sweet incense of so many acts of pure trust and comfort him for so much mistrust on the part of souls whose fervor burns less brightly. From trust to surrender there is but a single step. There is no more valuable spiritual ordeal to teach us to surrender ourselves wholly to God. In consolation, all goes well. We are aware of the progress which we are making upon the path of perfection. The sun shines. The way is wide and direct and straight. But now the trees branch overhead. There is no road. Only a maze of tracks remain. There is desolation. We are as men who have no compass. We seem to be traveling in a circle. We continue to rely upon the self for guidance. This is the hour preferred above all hours by souls surrendered to God. They trust themselves blindly to the divine guide who has brought them to the forest and who has expert knowledge of the path known to him alone, which shall lead them out of it. 
To the surrendered soul that desires to win through love to self-forgetfulness, what more exquisite joy is there than thus blindly to follow the Master who leads it to union? That it may attain to more complete self-forgetfulness, it prefers to know nothing of the paths which Jesus follows, of the stages which it has passed, and which it has yet to reach. What precise point it has attained upon the road to perfection, it zealously avoids even the wish to know. Were it so much as to wish to lift the concealing curtain, it would lose the intimate and hidden joy which makes complete self-forgetfulness possible. I am the plaything, the little ball of the child Jesus, said that great disciple of surrender, the little Teresa of the child Jesus. The divine child can do with me what he wills, can play to his heart's content with his little ball, can amuse himself as he thinks proper, while if it gives him pleasure to stick pins in me or to put me in the corner, my happiness shall persist, for the very reason that it is his good pleasure. Indeed, she had a decided preference for desolations, since in them, rather than in consolation, she knew the delightful though unperceived joy not only of pleasing Jesus, but of pleasing him at cost to herself, of pleasing him at cost to her own pleasure. To complete a bunch of flowers which we have gathered on the bleak rocks of desolation, that lovely flower of charity, the queen of virtues, needs now to be mentioned for it too grows freely amid the boulders and the brambles of these spiritual ordeals, so many kinds of which exist. One of the most beautiful of them is love of suffering. True love of God cannot live without suffering. We are well aware of this, and more than once have proved it for ourselves. Now what more profitable suffering is there than that which detaches us from life's keenest delight the delight which comes of consciousness of God's love. Other spiritual ordeals detach us from joys of the senses, from riches, from reputation, from health. Desolation detaches us from these good things that, good materially, are not necessarily good spiritually. It is hard on God's account to forsake our riches, our pleasures, our friends, and ourselves. It is still harder for the soul which has forsaken all things for God, in a measure also to surrender God. Desolation is exile, exile not from our fatherland or from our parents. It is exile no less sorrowful to a soul a hungered of God, exile from God himself, our all, whose dear and delightful presence we surrender out of love for himself. It is that kind of exile which, if it be prolonged or intensified, can become a true martyrdom. Let us then love this ordeal that gives us such notable opportunities to show our love for Jesus and our desire to suffer for him. If it be true that we cannot practice great austerities, we can certainly suffer, generously and trustingly suffer, desolation. We can thus manifest to Jesus the fervor and purity of our love, more convincingly than by many other spiritual crosses. There is another variety of this fine flower of charity, an exquisite variety whose name is joy in the soul's insignificance and in its poverty. Those souls that have made some progress upon the way of pure love are well acquainted with this flower that others neglect. When they are conscious of themselves as weak, lacking in generosity, repulsive, even hideous, it is then that they find a particular delight in loving their poverty, in rejoicing in this manifestation of misery and even of faults. To them it is a joy to exult in displaying what insignificant and sinful creatures they are. And the reason for this? The reason is that pure love of God is necessarily hatred of self. The obverse of the coin of pure love is self-scorn. Here again is the reason why the happiness which comes of pure love has distinct constituent parts. 
the joy of marveling at and of loving as though they were its own, the enrapturing perfections of God and of Jesus, the equal joy of holding in hatred and in horror as though it were a stranger and an enemy, the supreme ugliness of the self. The loving soul feeds on this double joy. It gives us happiness to discover ourselves so ugly, so inherently imperfect, so evilly inclined, to declare that the once so greatly loved self that has now become our great enemy and the enemy of God is utterly odious, in that its very repulsiveness sets in still greater relief the ineffable perfections of God. We have cast from us, as though it were a verminous garment, this scoundrelly self, the former object of our complacency. Henceforth we find all our joy in the infinite lovableness of God, now become our new self. It is for this reason that all which humbles the self, our old-time tyrant and seducer, has for us become a source of secret joy. Our fervent love of God makes us glad at heart to see our common enemy unmasked, to perceive his repulsiveness so completely discovered that we no longer need to fear seduction by his deceiving charms. How pure and beautiful an expression of love for God is this love of our misery and of our poverty, this love which is known solely to the initiated, to those souls to whom God has revealed these mysteries. How far from commonplace is this love of our repulsiveness that enables us strangely to find our happiness, where so many spiritual souls find only sadness and discouragement. St. Francis de Sales loved to speak of this mysterious joy brought by love of our debasement. St. Teresa of the Child Jesus has written delightfully of it. It was she who wrote, quote, Many weaknesses have been mine, yet in them I rejoice. It is dear delight to know oneself weak and insignificant." Unquote. Here, then, is that pure love which desolation so often gives us the opportunity of practicing. Were it to produce but this one flower, this flower that is a hybrid of love and of humility, desolation would be dear indeed to us would make us as dear to Jesus, the gardener of our soul. Let us not seldom ask for this mighty and availing grace that alone can reveal to us the mysterious joy of despising the self for love's sake, this joy that more than all things shall contribute to killing the old Adam in us. The joy which comes of love is not always conscious. The objection will perhaps be raised that though in theory, doubtless, desolation can be for all of us an opportunity for many virtuous deeds performed, yet in practice the effect of desolation is precisely to make us unable to do such deeds, or at best to do them with no joyous heart. The joy of self-abandonment, the joy of suffering, the joy of self-forgetfulness for Jesus' sake, the joy of self-scorn. All these may be possible in consolation, but certainly not in desolation. From the outset, let us not confuse the joy of the sense with that joy which is happiness, as true and as deep as it is hidden and imperceptible. In spiritual barrenness we do not know it is plain. The conscious joy of loving Jesus, by reason of our self-abandonment, our suffering, or our self-forgetfulness. Yet we can most certainly know peace at our heart's core and the inner satisfaction of our gift of self. Moreover, the greater the advance we make in the ways of the Spirit, the greater is the detachment we achieve in the things of the senses, and the greater, too, our ability to penetrate the most secret recesses of our soul, there to have knowledge of the peace and unconscious happiness of pure love. A more serious difficulty, however, is this. How, without conscious joy, to make specific acts of love for God, acts of resignation and so forth, is either holy or almost holy beyond our knowledge. 
our mind grows blank, our heart grows heavy within us. Consciously, to perform any act that shall make plain either our love of God, of resignation, or of trust, seems to us compact of pain indeed. A great weight seems to press upon our soul. Yet it is true that one such act performed to the best of our ability, as opportunity offers, is infinitely pleasing to God. Moreover, the performance of such an act is simplicity itself. It needs but an aspiration, a becoming inclination of the heart, a single sigh of the soul. Direct acts of the soul that are infinitely precious. If even this be difficult, if we be unable often to make such acts because of the pain with which they are fraught, let us reflect that there are acts which are not reflex, the direct acts of our soul. Of these we have little or no consciousness. God alone, who knows us better than we know ourselves, perceives them hidden in the depths of our soul, and unknown to us, is by them made exceedingly glad of heart. These hidden, secret, and altogether spontaneous acts the soul performs almost perpetually. Does a loving mother, who watches with admirable devotion over her sick child, love him only when she heaps him with kisses and caresses? The truth is that there is no intermission in her unspoken love. Ceaselessly she gives herself to the dear child over whom she keeps vigil. Her sadness and anxiety are both the consequence and the proof of her unvarying love of him. The mere look of agony which she gives the child is in itself an act of love, a direct, not a reflex act. In desolation, this holds true of ourselves. To be sad because of our love for him at the absence of Jesus, to no aspiration for him, is an act of love that gushes without ceasing from our heart as a full spring from the side of a hill. There's no doubt that Jesus has all the joy with which these acts are instinct. The living water brings refreshment to him, but not to ourselves. Yet does this matter? Better still, with trust to surrender ourselves, to believe in his love despite all things. Carefree, and of our own will to fall asleep as though we slept in the arms of Jesus, does not this involve an unbroken succession of direct, not reflex, acts of loving abandonment? While if from time to time we perform an act of love that is both explicit and reflex, this act will be like the kiss which the child gives his mother, the kiss which is but the more demonstrative expression of that love which enables him to sleep peacefully at his mother's breast. Whatever the ways by which God leads us, whether of desolation on the one hand or of consolation on the other, we can be certain that each day of our life will be rich in acts meritorious in God's sight. Gaze upon these ripe fields with their million heavy wheat ears waving in the wind, it is God who has had each of these blades in his care, and not merely these blades, but each of their many grains which his love has brought into being, that we may have food. Shall not God, who has infinitely more solicitude for our souls ransomed by the blood of Jesus, make it his care to have them produce the blades of virtuous acts? If we be fervent, the most apparently empty of our days, whether these be days of desolation, days of weakness, or days of sickness, are full of these golden blades, which are our acts of virtue, whether direct or reflex. Our sole care must be in no way to pander to our vanity, for vanity also has as many direct acts as virtue. In the field of our soul it mingles with those blades, that are heavy with their riches of divine love, all too many barren blades, blades of self-love. How much happier we should be in desolation if we had greater consciousness of the value of our direct acts, of these states of soul 
that give it its true orientation towards God, of which our reflex acts are only a clearer expression, but no whit more meritorious for that. Our one need is this, of our own will to renounce the pleasure which our acts bring us, that conscious and perceptible pleasure which comes of our reflex acts. We must know how to surrender the conscious joy which we have of our virtues, that all this joy may appertain to Jesus. And this is no easy thing. It implies much self-abnegation and self-forgetfulness. It needs much love. Such joy to be renounced that its activity may be experienced. It is for this reason that spiritual desolation is so precious. It makes the self die more completely within us. To our vanity, consciousness of our own activity, and the knowledge that we are responsible of many virtuous acts brings delight. The secret self-satisfaction which pervades us is an intoxicating wine that leaves us reeling with delicious ecstasy. Therefore, we need not one, but hundreds of desolations, of periods of spiritual barrenness and of seeming inactivity, that we may be rid of this cursed self-complacency. To tear this weed from our soul, we need not once but many times to realize the impossibility of performing acts of virtue, whether interior or exterior, to realize equally the seeming uselessness of our contemplations and our spiritual indolence in general, that this weed may be destroyed, that we may the more thoroughly slay the self-will in us, Jesus is prepared even to allow us visible faults, to permit us to know minor humiliating lapses and infidelities that may serve the good of our souls. He counts nothing too much if it extirpate this persistent manifest manifestation of our self-love. In desolation, he often takes from us the joy of realizing our activity and the progress which we've made, and with it our consciousness of the acts of virtue performed by us. What happiness we should know in thinking that the joy which he takes from us makes glad his own heart. At his leisure, he takes delight in all these countless direct acts of love, of trust, of humility, of self-surrender, of which, in the midst of our spiritual ordeals, our heart is the visible theater. I can always be well-pleasing to Jesus. If we are truly wistful of love, wistful of self-surrender and of self-forgetfulness for Jesus' sake, what more do we need to be happy in desolation? Upon this earth what is, what should be, our one desire. It is the ability to please Jesus greatly, and with Jesus, God, whom we love. This is the desire which is absolutely and unconditionally ours, the desire to which we have some measure of right, the desire which Jesus does not ask us to sacrifice to himself. All but this he can ask from us. He can ask from us the sacrifice of a particular kind of life, of a particular kind of grace, of a particular director of our choice, of a particular apostolate, of some seeming success in our own spiritual life or in that of souls directed by us. He can ask from us the sacrifice of this or the other spiritual consolation, of this or that plan for holiness. Never will he ask that we shall sacrifice to him that supreme joy of the loving soul, the joy of pleasing him greatly, utterly. For this joy is equally the supreme joy of his divine heart. He yearns to make it ours. How then shall he refuse it to us? How then will he take it away? Do you then rejoice, O loving soul, whose unique desire is to please the divine master? Whatever plan God may have for you, whatever the way by which he leads you, whether in desolation or in consolation, you can please Jesus, can please him utterly. To give pleasure to this dear master is the very breath of our soul. 
Without that breath you could not live. Jesus knew this well. To please him one thing only is necessary. Do your utmost. Do your best. Give Jesus all your good will. This you can always do, even in the midst of the blackest desolations. In simplicity of soul, you can always do your utmost. At such hours, in naked faith, you can abandon yourself blindly to his love. At such hours, Jesus asks no more of you than this. He is too reasonable to demand the impossible. Oh, with what transcendent peace! this sweet conviction that you are at all times able to give Jesus pleasure and to bring him joy must inspire your soul. How this conviction must simplify and unify your whole life. Now and forever, despite all vicissitude and superficial change, in the depth of your heart the same intimate, calm, and profound happiness can establish itself unassailably that happiness of giving pleasure to Jesus, himself the unique treasure of your heart. This, even when the contrary, seems true. It does not follow that this happiness will always be a conscious happiness, a happiness that the soul can relish with delight, certainly not. Such a happiness is calculated solely and inevitably to feed our vanity with egoistic enjoyment. In most cases, this happiness is a happiness relating to the spirit and in no way to the senses, a happiness whose sanctuary is to be found in the most secret of the secret recesses of our soul, a happiness of which we are wholly unconscious. It is nonetheless real for this. As we've previously said, Jesus will never ask us for the sacrifice of that supreme happiness of every loving soul the happiness of pleasing him utterly. Nevertheless, at first sight it would seem that we are mistaken. It is not rarely that we know those particularly agonizing and often prolonged ordeals in which not only do we lack the conscious joy of being able to please Jesus, but in which we have the keen and bitter consciousness of no longer pleasing him or even of displeasing him. Jesus seems to have turned his back upon us. What great grief lies in this! What overwhelming doubt! What good purpose does our life serve, if it be no longer pleasing in his sight? For what is the aim of our life but to permit Jesus to live in us, in us and through us, to give him cause for rejoicing? Of what use are sacrifices, our austerities, if they be no longer pleasing to Jesus? if they no longer bring him joy. For then the sweet incense of our love and of our devotion no longer ascends to God. Poor forsaken soul, even then have trust, now and forever have trust. Believe, despite all things, that you are pleasing to Jesus, that you are altogether pleasing to him. In your secret soul does not something tell you that Jesus loves you as of old? that you remain as pleasing in his eyes, as pleasing as you were in those former hours of loving intimacy? Cling to the secret conviction of your soul as the unheard-of voice of Jesus. In the past, has trust in God ever failed you? Nor will it fail you now. When the storm has passed, and when all is calm in and about you, the sweet voice of Jesus makes itself heard clearly anew, bidding you know how infinitely pleasing it is your blind trust to him. Recall our Lord's words to St. Catherine of Siena. After temptation had assailed her violently, she cried to him, O God, where are you now? In your own heart, replied Jesus. We are not to confuse the joy of giving pleasure with the joy of knowing that we give pleasure. We must not then confuse the joy of pleasing Jesus and of rejoicing his divine heart with that other joy of knowing that we please him or of being conscious of the fact. We can always be well pleasing in the sight of Jesus if we wish it, but we shall not always have the conviction and consciousness of it. There are times indeed 
when we have the contrary conviction, when in this matter we know cruel doubt. This is always the case in the night of the senses and in the night of the spirit. Yet, if our love be truly pure and our trust truly unassailable, all things despite we shall believe that we shall please him, while it shall be our joy to sacrifice for Jesus our conscious delight in it. What matters it ultimately if we seek only the joy of Jesus? What matters it whether or not I feel and know that I am pleasing to Jesus? So only I please him, so only he be happy, the rest matters nothing. It is not my joy, but his that I desire, and I am ready to sacrifice for him even this beneficent and noble joy of knowing that I please him, if this be the requirement of his good pleasure. St. Teresa of the Child Jesus expressed this delightfully. Writing during her novitiate to the mother Agnes of Jesus, she said, quote, Of Jesus ask that I may love him disinterestedly. So only Jesus be conscious of it. I do not desire myself to be conscious of my love for him. That Jesus be aware of my love is all I ask. Unquote. On another occasion she wrote to her sister, quote, Your little daughter has heard little of heaven's vast music. The course of her nuptials has been an arid course. Yet do not imagine that this leaves her sad of heart. This is far from being the case. It is her joy to go whither her betrothed goes, for his own sake and not for the sake of his gifts. In himself he is beautiful, he is rapturously beautiful. Though he keep silence, though he hide himself from my eyes, yet his rapturous beauty remains. We are to love the God of consolations and not the consolations of God. How utterly we are deceived by this impression, known to us in spiritual aridity, of our inability to please Jesus, due to the fact that we grow spiritually numb and that we no longer know conscious love. As has already been shown, desolation permits us to perform countless acts, direct or reflex, it matters not which, of profound humility, of blind trust, of love of suffering, of mortification of the self. It gives us, therefore, countless opportunities of pleasing Jesus and of bringing him joy. In particular, it gives us the great advantage of being able to love Jesus with a pure and disinterested love. It is sadly true that in consolation we are tempted to love ourselves and in ourselves to put our trust. We are aware of the wings which consolation gives us, and upon them we rely. We are conscious of the joy of love, and we all but forget to love God in our love of the dear delight which we have in his love. In desolation it is far otherwise. Then, if we persist in our love, our love has no other goal than God. No longer do we love God for the sake of his gifts, of which we are no longer conscious. We love him purely for his own sake. In this way we detach ourselves from the consolations of God, that we may attach ourselves to the God of consolations. That alone should give us a preference for desolations and spiritual aridities. If we be desirous of loving Jesus with a pure love, we ought to welcome with glad hearts these excellent opportunities for practicing this love that Jesus himself has chosen for us. Doubtless this is no easy thing. This is all to the good. The more we advance in love, the more we shall delight in these opportunities for pure love. Teresa said, Let us love Jesus sufficiently to be willing to suffer all that he would have us suffer, though it be aridities and numbness of the soul. If we have a great love of loving Jesus and make no demand to experience that love sweetness, this is great love indeed, this is love's very martyrdom. Then let us die loves martyrs. What delight we should give the heart of Jesus were we to love him in desolation with a loving trust.
You who would be a faithful friend of Jesus, bringing him solace for all those who do not love him, set your vanity to love him in times of spiritual barrenness, in those times when this is the will of Jesus also. Make it your happiness to love him upon Calvary no less than upon Thabor. Love him with a pure love, not wholly on behalf of those who fail to love him or of those who actually offend him, but still more on behalf of those countless souls whose love for him is poor and weak, who love themselves more than they love him. Goodwill, an act of love ever and everywhere, and nothing more, this henceforth is my program. It is for Jesus to take care for the rest, to love God, to love him at my own cost, to love him without enjoying, to love him in suffering, to love him in weariness, dryness, darkness, doubts, scruples, temptations, somber visions of the future. Such shall be my lot, as my master shall will it. I know that he's good, I know that he loves me, I believe in his love. And to love thee thus, O my dear master, delights me. To enjoy thee I have an eternity, but to cause thee to enjoy my love through suffering and immolation, I have only my short existence here. Then take from my substance, O my master, all that it contains, and is able to yield to the glory of thy name. Draw from it abundantly, so that when I come to die, I may have become wholly thine. We have the right to sigh for the Beloved's return. Ought we then to prevent ourselves from sighing for the return of Jesus, if he bids us sigh for him? No, for these loving sighs are the evidence of our love. They are wholly pleasing in the sight of Jesus. All the saints have known these ardent desires, have wept these tears of a desolate soul. Those lovely lines of St. Bernard will be recollected. O sweetest Jesus, thou hope of my languishing soul, it is thou whom my pious tears seek out. It is thou after whom from the secret places of my soul I cry aloud. Let the grace implicit in these words be our guide. At times, we shall choose to surrender ourselves and to make a loving trust our soul's sweet pillow. At other times we shall awaken from our sleep and in love shall stretch forth our arms towards him whom our heart so fervently desires. Desolation urges us to draw upon the treasures of Jesus, our divine sufficiency, who lives in us. As we've clearly seen, desolation has good title to our esteem and to our love. If we be thoroughly convinced of this in hours of tranquility and peace, this conviction will be our great strength in hours of spiritual ordeal. Nevertheless, it can and does often happen that such reflection seems in no way to help us in the sufferings and anxieties of desolation. Possibly it's the will of Jesus that we should seek safe sanctuary in his divine heart. When we're aware of ourselves as poor, sad, loveless, spiritually numb, when we imagine ourselves to have nothing to offer to God, then, weary with struggling, almost instinctively, we turn towards Jesus. True as this is for all of us, it is especially true of those happy souls who endeavor to live the life of identification with Christ. Finding in hours of spiritual barrenness in themselves everything that is poor, wretched, and repulsive, they naturally look to Jesus, their divine sufficiency in adoration, in reparation, and above all, in love. They recollect that they are not alone in their life and their love for God, but that they live in union with and for Jesus. They know that their life is only the life of Jesus dwelling within them, and that Jesus makes use of them to love and to adore the Father. In consolation there are times when he manifests his life more obviously. A spark from the great furnace of the love of Jesus has been kindled in their own heart and possesses them with its sweet consuming fire. Normally they are scarcely conscious of the love of Jesus in themselves, 
though they clearly perceive that the very beating of the heart of Jesus is his unchanging love of the Father abiding within them. Jesus has made no withdrawal of himself. In reality, the soul is even now not left alone to serve, to love, and to adore the Father. It is simply that Jesus has hidden himself in the soul's secret depth, and from that living altar makes ascend towards the eternal, the incense of his pure love. You are no longer conscious of the love of Jesus quickening your faculties and binding them with its spell, that in you he may love the Father. No matter, Jesus is forever there in the depths of your heart. Where once you felt generosity, a thirst for self-sacrifice, a thirst for trust, a thirst for love, you feel now only spiritual languor and sterility. What does this imply? Yours is something far finer than these miserable perfections, in which, in consolation, you too frequently put overmuch trust. Yours are those ineffable perfections of Jesus, who lives within you. Instead of the paste and the imitation pearls which your own poor virtues are, you can make offerings to God of the precious rubies and the magnificent diamonds of the virtues of Jesus. You can offer him his profound humility, his perfect trust, his utter selflessness, his limitless love. In this lies your true consolation, unaware of it though you may be. In the last resort, in this lies too your greatest means of finding grace in God's sight, of making yourself well-pleasing in his eyes, and of offering him a blessed and unblemished host that shall be worthy of him. Blessed be that desolation which sends you thus to the true treasure of your soul, and enables you to discover in your extreme poverty your immense riches. The true conception of desolation, no less than the springtime of consolation, its winter is necessary to the spiritual life. Under whatever form we meet it, whether as aridity, sadness, or obscurity, the impossibility of praying or aversion to things of the Spirit, let us make it our constant endeavor to have of desolation an increasingly true and exact conception. Let us realize that desolations are essential to the divine workman, whose whole effort is bent towards ridding our soul of its vain stone of impurity in order to convert it into a diamond worthy of his heavenly Father. Many souls, whose spiritual experience is limited, imagine desolation to be a punishment, as consolation was a reward of their sacrifices and their generosity. This is a complete delusion. There are times, doubtless, when this can be true, above all at the beginning of the spiritual life, yet far more often, in God's plan, desolation is a special mark of love, a grace which is to lead us onward and upward, and to bring us near to ultimate union. If we are unaware of any particular fault or infidelity, we are ill-advised to torment our soul with constant introspection, with restless self-examination. If we will, let us humble ourselves, let us ask the Lord's pardon for all those faults that we've committed in ignorance. But then let us straightway expand our soul with loving trust. For at these times we have great need of such trust, that we may remain faithful to our resolutions, that we may not change our mode of life, and that we may not seek consolations among creatures to compensate ourselves for those which the Creator no longer gives us. We need all our soul's energies if we are to profit truly from this precious time and to fulfill the plans which God has for us. A footnote. On this subject we cannot afford to forget the golden rule which St. Ignatius, that great master of the spiritual life, has given us in his rules upon the discernment of spirits. This is that hours of desolation are not propitious for cool judgment and that in them 
we must not alter our former resolutions or mode of action. To continue, normally desolation is not a punishment for our follies and our infidelities. It is a precious and necessary means of purification. The divine consolations reveal to us the perfections and the lovableness of God that we may be kindled with love for Him. Spiritual desolations discover to us all our inherent poverty, all our repulsiveness, that we may know a profound disgust for ourselves and may be inspired with a holy hatred of self. Here, then, are the indispensable springs and winters of the spiritual life. These alternating spiritual seasons are mostly planned by God that we may be led to perfect union and to true holiness. He varies them in nature and in length according to the needs of our soul. We have no cause then to grow sad of heart when desolation is of long continuance. On these occasions we are easily tempted to imagine that we're losing precious time. We who would run with glad heart in the spiritual way in the beloved company of Jesus suddenly perceive that Jesus has disappeared. He seems to have forgotten us, left us to ourselves, so that consequently we make no progress. Let us undeceive ourselves. Jesus does not forget us. Of our love he is more desirous than we are, infinitely more than we he yearns for our holiness. His apparent forgetfulness is a precious grace. He works now in the depths of our soul that he may purify us, may remove from us all obstacles to divine union. He works ceaselessly both day and night with a tireless patience and an immense desire. Useless branches he prunes and lops. He makes winter follow spring and summer. He allows the flowers to fall one by one and stores the fruit which he perceives to be ripe. He knows that the trees grow, that each return of spring will bring new flowers and fruit more delicious than before, till the day shall come when in our soul he can harvest the fruit of perfect love. In Desolation Jesus is indulgent towards our weakness. In conclusion, let us not forget that Jesus is infinitely good, indulgent, and compassionate. If in our spiritual ordeals we are somewhat lacking in generosity, if there be times when in a measure we relax, let us not think that all is lost and that Jesus is displeased with us. Jesus knows how to take the long view of our difficulties of our repugnancies and our weaknesses, while if broadly we do our utmost, he does not hesitate to close his eyes, ignoring our minor faults. Let us not sadden ourselves by saying, In desolation I lack generosity. It is true that I bear my cross, yet it is with no stout heart that I bear it, but rather as though I were about to fall beneath its weight. Of how many petty faults I am guilty, of how many reversions to the life of the natural man. How different it is in times of consolation. Jesus knows all this better than ourselves, and if despite his knowledge he sends us his spiritual ordeals, it is because he looks for rich results from them. It is because our petty faults are on the whole balanced by our general attitude of resignation of self-surrender, and of humility. We know that to them that love God all things work together for good. If only we keep faithful our love for Jesus and preserve a keen desire to love Him always more abundantly despite our petty faults, spiritual ordeals will be salutary for us and alternating with consolations will lead us insensibly towards high perfection. Chapter 16 Trust in the Spiritual Nights Mystical is not a synonym for extraordinary. This, said for the comfort and consolation of souls plunged deep in desolation, 
holds good in the varying kinds of spiritual ordeal known by the generic term desolation. There is, too, a special kind of ordeal known to mystical souls, an ordeal particularly disconcerting no less for its nature and for its intensity than for its duration. Souls that God has plunged into these ordeals are particularly worthy of compassion. They need to be given more often and more especially comfort and new courage that they may be able to endure as they should these crucifying ordeals. We are dealing here with the mystical life. For some, the very word mystical is a bugbear. Because of this, we need to make an initial remark that we may obviate errors and possibly dissipate certain prejudices. The mystical life does not imply, as so many imagine, the extraordinary life. That great saint of our times, Teresa of the Child Jesus, attained to the most exalted peaks of the mystical life and of holiness. Nevertheless, the most extraordinary thing in her life was its apparent absence of anything extraordinary. She was at pains to say again and again that her new life of loving trust, her way of a little child, contained nothing that was extraordinary. With her there were neither visions nor revelations. To the best of our belief with her there were not even ecstasies. Here was a wholly ordinary life passed for the greater part in spiritual sterility and desolation. In its essence, the mystical life in no wise consists of these phenomena that are its accidental concomitants, visions, raptures, ecstasies, supernatural utterances. It consists in the growing enrichments of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the gifts which leave us increasingly passive under the action of grace, and thus give God a stronger and stronger hold upon our life. This enrichment is the result of special and gratuitous graces called operative graces, and is wholly without our own reach. We can prepare ourselves to receive them, we cannot induce them. To speak more specifically of mystical contemplation, this must not be confused with mystical life. It is essentially a light infused into the intelligence and a love infused into the will due to the inpouring of the gifts of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. In other words, infused or mystical contemplation is a simple and loving and normally a confused and general concentration of the soul upon God and things divine. With it there are alternatives. It can exist solely at hours of formal prayer or it can thoroughly impregnate one or more of our actions, or even our entire day, maintaining us in a more or less continuous loving union with God. The mystical life, then, has nothing about it which need terrify us. Many men are mystics, yet exteriorly do not differ in any respect from their fellows. At most, possibly exteriorly, they suggest a trifle more of recollection than others. None suspect the ways by which they walk. Read the life of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, and scrutinize it as you will. You will discover no evidence in it of the mystic ways. It requires a practiced eye to discover indications of these. Usually, not only do we fail to suspect those mystical souls which live at our side, but these souls themselves, particularly at the beginning, of the mystical life have no consciousness of their state. Probably would they would make sincere protest were they taxed with being mystics. The main stages of the mystical life. What then are the main stages of the mystical life, as they are generally encountered and as they have been admirably described in his Dark Night by that doctor of mysticism, St. John of the Cross? First of all, there is the night of the senses, one purpose of which is to detach the soul from all things of the senses and to make it capable of contemplation. This night can last many years. It is normally followed by a period of peace, 
and of vivid consolations. After this, the soul which God destines for final union enters upon the night of the Spirit, whose aim is to purify completely the soul's spiritual part and to lead the latter into holiness. Let us examine each of these three main stages, making the initial remark that God is bound by no law and that in practice every case is different from every other. At the beginning of the spiritual life, generally, although not invariably, God gives consolations at once more rich and vivid in that he desires to lead the soul to higher things. In this way, he seeks to detach it from all those human joys that are negligible in comparison with the intimate joys of divine love. Subsequently, when he perceives the soul to be sufficiently detached from earthly consolations, he begins to deprive it of the conscious joys of the spirit. Gradually, he takes from it the inclination and the pleasure which it feels in performing acts of virtue, acts of charity, acts of humility and mortification. He filches from it, too, the joys of prayer. Without exaggerating too greatly the change wrought in it, the soul begins to experience considerable difficulty in meditating, in praying as before by the use of the intellect. For this it feels a secret aversion. Beneath the action of God its whole life is simplified. Its spiritual activity seems to grow strangely less. Whereas it loved formerly to express itself in prayer, in varying sentiments of humility, of mortification, of trust, of self-denial, of love of God, it feels itself impelled to talk in all simplicity with God, or even to remain near Him in the simple and peaceable attitude of trusting love, like a child in the arms of its mother. Reflex acts have as little attraction for it as it has facility for them. Gradually and secretly God favors it with the gift of infused prayer or of contemplation. With only a vague perception of the means, from time to time it feels, now in prayer, now otherwise, united to him in a general, faint, yet loving concentration upon God, its beloved. It is this sorrowful transition from the ordinary life to the mystical life and from meditation to contemplation which is called the night of the senses. Its days are days of secret suffering, of sorrowful spoilation of soul. The soul deprived of conscious spiritual joys is yet not skilled in relishing the purer and more secret spiritual joys which contemplation offers. Desolation and aridity seem to possess it utterly. It looks upon itself as idle and inactive, as given over to the deadness of routine. Moreover, these years of the night of the senses are the more painful in that the soul does not take into full account the divine action of God. Wistful of drawing near to God that later it may know union with him, at the moment it imagines itself to be in a constant state of retrogression. Where now, it asks itself, are its fervent and undistracted prayers, its desire for suffering, its absorbing transports of love? Further, it is even possible that its spiritual director, himself not guessing at the essential change which is taking place in it, merely increases its anguish by urging it to its old-time generosity. It frequently happens that the soul, sighing for its initial conscious fervor, makes sorrowful efforts to return to its former modes of prayer, its sequent logic, and its feverishly agitated spiritual activity. Yet these efforts that counter the action of God succeed only in aggravating its discomfort and its suffering. Again, to make the situation yet more poignant and agonizing, it seems to it that the day of its deliverance will never dawn. How shall it survive this ordeal? What knowledge has it of the ordeal itself? In fact, is it sure that it is indeed an ordeal? Were it only sure, this would in itself be a great consolation. For the ordeal, long as it is, 
seems endless. It lasts for years, sometimes few, sometimes many, according to the plan of God. The intensity of the night, the degree of perfection to which God would have the soul attain, its docility under God's purifying action, the grossness of the imperfections of which it needs to be purified, these are so many factors which affect its duration. Undoubtedly the night does not remain uniformly dreadful. There are times when the winds drop. There are other times when the storm redoubles its fury. It can be said that normally this sorrowful and purifying ordeal lasts several years. The soul is without power to set a term to it. Neither by the use of skill nor by the taking of thought can it set itself free. God purifies us much as gold is purified in a crucible. When the desired degree of purity is attained, then once more the radiant day will break and God will invite the soul anew to the joys of the divine love. For winter is now past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers have appeared in our land. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come. Usually, says St. John of the Cross, God then accords the soul a respite, often of several years. He gives it to re relish anew and at length his divine consolation, but more purely, more nobly, more spiritually than before. It is in the most secret places of the soul that he makes revelation of himself. It is there that with the words inaudible to the senses, he floods the soul with infused and exquisite lights and holds it spellbound by the charm of his divine lovableness. It is there that he puts love's fetters upon it. He makes his beloved presence once more known to it, though in a manner much more intimate than before. Consequently, there are times when love overwhelms it. It cannot contain its raptures and breaks into ardent transports. At other times it keeps silence, sleeping peacefully and lovingly upon the breast of its beloved God. Thus with each new day it attaches itself more straightly, more indissolubly to Him. Moreover, trust grows proportionately with love. God makes the soul so well aware of His exquisite goodness that it responds by protestations of eternal fidelity and of blind trust in Him. These are the fat years during which it makes ample provision of trust for the lean years. It lays in reserves of strength for the supreme ordeal now imminent, if it be destined to mount still higher. For though many souls pass through the night of the senses, it is only too few, mystical authorities declare, of the number of faithful and generous souls whom God submits to the final and decisive ordeal which is to lead to transforming union and to true holiness. At the hour willed by God, the soul enters once more into the night, the dreadful night of the spirit, which brings with it supreme passive purification. Only those who have known the terrors of the sorrowful night can relish the full anguish of this great ordeal. It is purgatory upon earth, which, to quote St. John of the Cross, takes the place of purgatory awaiting us in the other life. In its spiritual part, above all, in its intelligence, memory, will, the soul is now purified. Its theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, chiefly due to the gift of understanding, are rid of the last and the least of its imperfections. To its old modes of action, based upon its human and natural self, the soul must die completely. It is truly nourished upon the bread of sorrow with the gall of tribulation. With the prophet David it can cry, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in even unto my soul. I stick fast in the mire of the deep. There is no sure standing. I am come into the depth of the sea, and a tempest hath overwhelmed me. My eyes have failed whilst I hope in my God. There are times when the night is so black, 
when the darkness is so thick that the soul finds it difficult to remember the sunny days of yesteryear. In place of that passive and infused sentiment of the presence of God, which is so dear to it and which kindles it with love, it has only the consciousness of his absence. To intimacy with him succeeds a boding silence. In vain it seeks him, in vain it calls aloud to him, in vain it stretches out towards him and the arms of its vast desires. From him it has no answer. Everywhere I have sought him whom my soul loveth, I have sought him and found him not. It is still truer of the night of the senses that the soul has a strong conviction and a clear consciousness of its retrogression. At times it believes itself about to fall headlong into the abyss. Giddiness seizes it. It imagines itself to be destined to hell. If these ultimate agonies are infrequent, yet often it seems to be displeasing to God, to have irritated God, to have forfeited his desire for its love. Moreover, is it not altogether right as to this? How could he love with a pure love so repulsive a creature? How could he contemplate a union of himself with that which is merely egoistic pride? It has an unassailable conviction that God no longer loves it and that it too no longer loves God. The divine fire which once burnt in its heart is quenched. This is daylight clear to it and it is in vain that perpetually it seeks to light that fire again. Yet, if the manifestations of the divine love be no longer evident, unknown to the soul, God has instilled in it a new love of vast depth. God, hidden though he be, seems to it both lovable and worthy to be loved. Without permitting it to know the dear delight of his divine lovableness, God nevertheless draws it to himself. How it would love to the limit of love this unique and infinite lovableness which is God. It would love him, utterly love him, but from the abyss of its night there comes an ominous voice. You are not worthy of loving the infinite. He no longer loves you, and you, you no longer love him. For you, this is the end of love. Of this it is only too sadly convinced, although in the depth of its secret soul there perpetually flickers a gleam of hope that is an inner assurance of the contrary, but in this it dare not place its trust. What anguish of love is known to this soul? What strange torture! Its immense desires to love, its overburdening griefs are in themselves a great love made manifest. Yet Blinded as it is by purifications, a little as is the owl by the too strong light of day, it cannot perceive this. Possibly the soul's directors perceive this clearly and state it precisely. Yet how shall the soul dare to believe in that which by some strange magic appears to it as patently untrue? It loves God vastly, wildly, yet at the same time believes and feels itself to be stripped of all love. Like Angela of Foligno, it would exclaim, Alas, when I behold the love with which God has loved me, my own love is no more than a weak jest and an abominable lie. That is the most burdensome affliction of this night. Compared with that all the rest, painful though it be, is as nothing. This affliction is a foretaste of hell's horrors, of the fate of the damned. The soul knows what Jesus knew upon the cross when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This second night, too, lasts years. Usually, for a considerable period, the ordeal is pure bitterness. In it is no wit of consolation. Yet after it, the great work of purification now perfected, the soul begins to breathe again. From time to time glimmerings of dawn streak the horizon. For brief moments God, the great hidden God, makes himself manifest 
and gives the soul new ecstasies of happiness. It begins to be conscious of its vast love for God. The anxiety and anguish of its own love disappears, yet the soul remains pierced with the love of God. Its great grief is now, and will continue to be, its inability, despite its extreme love for God, to love Him in a measure worthily, to love Him as He desires to be loved, to love Him for Himself, and, with apostolate's aid, to love Him no less for others. An insatiable thirst for love will torture it ceaselessly, while simultaneously the contrast between the perfections of God and its own incredible repulsiveness will detach it utterly from the self. Thus, gradually, will purification be perfected, and the night change by degrees into the dazzling day of transforming union and of perfect love. From this ordeal the soul issues transformed and impregnated with God. In it God lives abundantly. He has substituted for its previous activity His own. Features of the Night of the Senses We will not discuss in further detail these passive purifications. The souls which God leads in these ways can, if they wish it, and with their director's approbation, read The Dark Night of St. John of the Cross. Here we will content ourselves with a few reflections. In the first place, how can it be discerned with certainty whether a soul is in the night of the senses and not merely exposed to spiritual sterility caused by faint-heartedness and so forth? St. John of the Cross notes for us three characteristic signs that are indeed valuable and that must be taken conjointly to establish beyond doubt the desired distinction. First sign. In the night of the senses there is to be found no delight, no consolation in divine things, and scarcely more in created things, for the gift of knowledge is strong upon the soul, revealing to it the vanity of all things. Second sign. In the night of the senses, the soul usually clings to the remembrance of God with a painful care and solicitude, due to the fear of retrogression and arising from its lack of relish for divine things. The gift of fear is revealed in this. This lively care is a plain sign that this spiritual barrenness is not the effect of faint-heartedness or of spiritual sickness. It is brought about because God transfers health and strength from the senses to the soul. The senses are wholly starved, but the soul begins to find new nourishment. The latter, in the beginning, makes small response, its spiritual palate being yet unused to this new and subtle savor. This spiritual nourishment takes the form of the beginning of an obscure and austere contemplation. Third sign. This is the difficulty of meditating as formerly by having recourse to the imaginative sense. The reason for this is that God is beginning to communicate Himself, no longer by the senses or by the reason, but by the means of pure spirit, which ignores discursive sequence and in which God communicates Himself in the act of simple contemplation. The gift of understanding now initiates us into a wholly superior knowledge of God. It is to this that the soul's inclinations turn. It finds it easy to dwell in simplicity near to God. It is content to find itself alone with Him without giving itself up to discursive acts or sequent thoughts. Difficulty in meditation, which is the third sign, is more or less customary and tends to increase. Nevertheless, it knows variation. At some hours it is more pronounced than at others. In the night of the senses, this state of the soul, therefore, is characterized by two negative features. Aridity, or deprivation of all conscious consolation, and the difficulty of meditation. Added to this is one positive feature, the beginning of infused contemplation, and the living desire for God which it arouses in us. 
Further, it is this positive element that is the cause of the two negative features. Let this be noted. This aridity and this difficulty of meditation are due to the fact that grace is taking a new and more spiritual form above the plane of the senses and of the imagination. God deprives us of sensual gratification, substituting for it a nobler gratification, which, however, brings us no delight until we have gradually grown accustomed to it. So it is with a child whom his mother has just weaned. His small teeth find it painful to bite the more substantial food, yet this pain is the gateway to stronger nourishment whose savor he slowly comes to relish. It is not hard, therefore, to understand why the soul which passes through the night of the senses, although knowing merely distaste and sterility in prayer, nevertheless instinctively clings to a vague and general remembrance of God. It is haunted by the thought of God. It hungers for Him. Better than all things else this proves that this sterility is not the effect of lukewarmness. God's purpose explains the sufferings of these nights. Our next concern is to understand the end which God pursues in these nights and to keep it consistently in mind. God strips the soul of all that is barrier to union. A footnote. St. John of the Cross emphatically and repeatedly points out that the night of the senses, and still more the night of the spirit, are essential for perfect purification, which is required for union. These alone can wholly purify the secret recesses of our soul. To continue, he would lead it to perfect union. To effect this, he must remove all barriers to this union, must detach the soul from all things, that he may attach it to himself alone. As St. John of the Cross says, to attain wholly to God who is all, you must wholly renounce yourself in all things. Again, with souls whom God has already in a measure detached from material goods by means of his spiritual consolations, these same consolations, in that they retain an element of the senses, easily provide opportunities of harmful attachment. The soul, instead of searching single-heartedly for God, seeks rather his gifts. As blessed Henry Suso strikingly points out in his book, The Nine Rocks, attachment to consolations is a great stumbling block to divine union. In the night of the senses, therefore, God deprives the soul utterly of every conscious spiritual joy, of every delight in the divine love. He plunges it into conscious aridity and accustoms it to a spiritual life yet more freed from the wheel of the senses, of the imagination, and of the reason. In the night of the senses God deprives the soul utterly of every conscious spiritual joy. It is his wish also to deprive the soul of its humanly inspired activities. The soul whose knowledge and whose love are of this kind may not achieve union with God in his infinite simplicity. With this motive, God simplifies the soul, slaying its natural activity, and gradually replacing it by an ever-increasing passivity. Where once it used human means to know God and to pray to Him by meditation and the aid of conscious ideas, it must make its own a supernatural approach to knowledge. It must know God by the infused light of contemplation. It no longer knows God, as do other men, by making distinction between the ideas of the senses and those of revelation, but by a secret light mysteriously received that falls directly upon the soul with no intervention of the senses. Where before its love was active, it must love with a passive and infused love that is the free gift of divine generosity. Its powers must therefore be stripped of their customary method of functioning, and in its place a superhuman and divine mode must be substituted, that they may be transformed and impregnated with God. In brief, God prepares the soul for the divine life of perfect union by progressively replacing the soul's own inherent activity 
with his infused and divine activity, its human life with his divine life. This is the reason why in the night of the senses prayer becomes arid and sterile. The soul can no longer meditate or reason, or at best can do so with difficulty and reluctance. Its prayers become vain and empty. From the intelligence and the will God takes the natural objective drawn from things of the senses, sparingly and gradually substituting for them a few first faint lights of infused contemplation. The wretched soul, which moreover has no realization of these changes, has no succor therefore either from the senses or from its yet undeveloped contemplation. Torpor and weariness, springing from inherent weakness, make all its prayers dull and dead. For the rest, the soul, accustomed only to the palpable things of the senses, at the beginning, holds of little worth these first supernatural and elementary glimmerings of light, of which, for the most part, it is unconscious. Unfamiliar with this new form of love and of knowledge, it grows perturbed and exasperated. It thinks itself apathetic, and would, as we've said previously, return to its former methods. Later, in the night of the spirit, contemplation itself with a different end in view becomes a means of secret suffering. Blindingly it reveals to the soul the sorrowful contrast of the infinite perfections of God with its wretched self. The soul, obsessed by its own extreme abjection, turns in revulsion from itself, and becoming wholly detached from that self, is altogether absorbed into God. The essential is trust. Let nothing discourage the soul. It shall be no endeavor of ours to seek to comfort a soul given over to the night of the senses, and still less to seek to deliver it from its sufferings. A footnote. There is no need to note here that it is not for the soul itself to discern if it be in the night of the senses or in that of the spirit. Upon this it should consult its director, consequently only those who through their directors know themselves to be in one of these two nights should make personal application of the thoughts contained in this chapter. To continue, patiently the divine artist cuts his diamond till its facets grow resplendent. Just so, no one can deliver the soul from its salutary sufferings under the action of God. Yet, what we would say to these souls who are infinitely worthy of immolation and of comparison alike is, have trust, now and forever, have utter trust. On this occasion, as on all others, none has been, none ever will be, deceived, by trust. In the depths of the soul thus wrought upon by God there is a secret instinct that despite all appearances to the contrary cries to it, Have trust, all is well. The finger of God is here. It is he who fashions you to his own liking. Be glad of heart. This is a necessary ordeal that shall lead you towards union. Therefore, O soul beloved of God, believe in this secret and profound instinct. All is indeed well. Yet do not desire to see with the eyes of the sense. Do not seek conviction by exhaustive use of the reason. Go forward in naked faith. Go forward with trust. Though you cannot perceive it, all is indeed well. Convince yourself only of this. Because it is night, you cannot see it now. When day returns, then shall you see and understand. Then shall you bless your obdurate trust. What are we to think of this ordeal? If it be prolonged indefinitely, is this not possibly a sign that it is no ordeal but a punishment? Or rather, if it were an ordeal and a God-given grace at the outset, have I not taken the wrong turning since? Have I not spoilt all by my lack of generosity and by my inamiability? Have I not lost altogether those graces of election which God once gave me? At times, 
spiritual directors themselves are troubled by the long duration of the ordeal. It may last even for years. No inconsiderable period of a lifetime to be passed in a kind of inactivity and of spiritual languor. Can this be right? This is the wrong approach. The wrong approach. The length of the ordeal must not disconcert us. Both the night of the senses and the night of the spirit, according to St. John of the Cross, as is shown by the case of so many saints, last years, sometimes many years. A footnote. St. Teresa passed eighteen years in purifying ordeals. St. Madeline de Pazzi, five years in the first place and sixteen years in the second. Blessed Henry Suso, ten years. Blessed Angela of Foligno, two years in the night of the Spirit. With certain of these, the ordeals were continuous. With others, they were intermittent. To continue, nor must we believe this to be precious time lost for all eternity. God looks upon it with very different eyes. He sees the change which is wrought beneath the action of this passive purification, there in those depths of our soul of which we have so little knowledge. He sees it and is glad of heart. Truly such time is not lost. On the contrary, it is extremely rich in results and in hidden acts of ever purer divine love. For every second of this time, many though they be, is made use of by God to work upon our soul and to prepare it for ultimate union. Nor distraction, nor inactivity in prayer. The distractions, so frequent in the prayer of souls plunged into spiritual night, are often the cause of much suffering. Yet they should not make us afraid. They are altogether natural. In contemplation, when our will alone is united to God, and the union has little or no power over our memory, our imagination, and our understanding, it is then that with the will stable in its loving unity with God, the understanding goes roaming. St. Francis de Sales and St. Teresa have described this travail of mystical souls very vividly. The great saint of prayer herself knew great suffering at its hands. During many years she could not pray a prayer as long as the potter noster without distractions. She has left us this prescription, not to rid us of distractions, for no such prescription exists, that we may not know spiritual hurt on account of them. This is it. Let us never be disturbed by the noise which the rattle of our imagination makes. We are to ignore these distractions. We are to put them gently on one side. They are the tormenting flies which one brushes away, and which it were foolishness to pursue. In the depths of our soul God has sight of our will that is stable in loving union with him. This is his sole concern. When his good pleasure shall dictate, with a rich inpouring of his infused light equally, he is able to charm and captivate those other faculties of ours, understanding and memory, and to bring them into union with himself. In any case, some may well say, our pitiful prayers are because of their pitifulness unavailing. We no longer know how to concentrate upon supernatural truth. While prayer merely repels us, in that it has become an empty and inoperative thing, strangely contrasting with our ardent meditation of days gone by. This, too, should neither astonish nor frighten us. It is, as we've previously seen, the natural result of the divine action. God has altered our approach to prayer. Step by step he changes our activity into prayer that an ever-increasing part may be played by infused knowledge of God and by simple contemplation. A footnote. In reality, God does not lessen the activity of the intelligence, but takes from it its human and natural approach to knowledge, and by the gifts of wisdom and of understanding, grants it a superhuman approach that is infinitely more exalted and that surpasses every concept and every image. The activity of the intelligence is not diminished, 
it is transformed and impregnated with God. The soul has no direct consciousness of this superhuman mode of activity, but merely an oblique consciousness begotten of the darkness and the suffering of these nights, that is to say, by the cessation of the human use of intelligence. To continue, let us then be comforted. These hours of prayer that seem so empty are in reality brimming with acts of divine love that are direct and not reflex. Though we do not suspect it, we love uninterruptedly. Each hour of prayer brings to blossom in the garden of our heart countless flowers that, though they be invisible to our own eyes, are not less delightful in the eyes of God, nor inactivity in the spiritual life. The inactivity in question, some again may say, permeates my whole life. It affects everything. It is even difficult, I find, to make those short exclamatory prayers and those aspirations that in former days I loved so much. I feel a great need of opportunities for humility, for patience, for mortification, of which I no longer have perception even. In certain directions my efforts seem wholly barren, doomed in advance to failure. I would correct this or the other fault yet never succeed in the attempt. To all these anxieties of yours there is but the one answer, so only you do your utmost, have no fear. Do what you can, obey God's prompting, nor have any anxiety as to the result which in the soul's night you shall be unable to foresee. No less than your prayer, all your days shall be filled with direct acts of love, with heroic patience, with utter self-surrender. From your heart they shall emanate, wave after wave, to become the refreshing delight of your beloved. Again, if in certain directions your efforts have nothing to show for them, this is because God is working in you to other ends, for most emphatically God's efforts are neither fruitless nor vain. Though you be unaware of it, he gives you a strong conviction of your own nothingness. He fills you with aversion for the unprofitable and egoistical self. Though you are unconscious of it, he destroys your offensive self-complacency. Your own activity may be far from encouraging. His divine activity, secret though it be, is magnificent indeed. The best activity possible to you is passivity under the divine action. It is for this that God is chiefly solicitous. It is his express desire to lessen your own natural activity and to transform it into a passivity that shall be marvelously amenable to grace. He makes you die to the self, that in you he may live and perform his work. O oh, dear and desirable death, that for all its agony leads on to a life divine. Further, when desolation is at its height, when the frail bark of your soul is the plaything of the storm, cling to your knowledge that God asks no more of you than loving self-abandonment. As it is the sole activity of which you are capable, so it is all that he desires of you. Do not perturb yourself unnecessarily, mistaking this for fervor. At such times God's requirement of you is wholly simple. Be conscious of your own nothingness. Be grateful for his mode of dealing with you. Dispose yourself for peaceful sleep, despite the angry waves. He is in the bark with you. How can you perish? Its pangs are the pangs of love, comforting characteristics of these nights. Another source of profound grief to the soul is its inevitable sense of retrogression. Failing to understand either its own state or God's action upon it, it cannot avoid the fear which it has at perception of the changes taking place in it. Its former somewhat feverish and restless activity in works and in prayer alike has been superseded by an activity that is at once simple and hidden, that savors indeed of idleness. 
the ecstasies of conscious love have yielded to spiritual coldness. Its desire for mortification has weakened. In its eyes these are so many signs of spiritual torpor. Should its director seek to reassure it, may this not be, the soul asks itself, because he has not understood as a result of its own faulty explanations. Or again, has he not given it comfort out of pure compassion, despite his own secret conviction? O oh, hapless soul, it is the night of your spirit. Remember that. Be convinced of that. Spiritually, you are like a blind man. You yourself cannot see, yet your director sees for you. It is not torpor. Love is far from dead in you. Your sadness and your grief are but the birth pangs of your love. The very reason of your sadness and your disquiet is that, without suspecting it, you love with such intensity. How clear and simple is this reflection! How well calculated to reassure you! Cling to your belief in it. Not once but many times you've told yourself, so only I can be sure of pleasing Jesus, all the sufferings of this night are of no account. The dread, the anxiety, at times the certainty even of displeasing God. It is the thought of these which tortures me. Would you have used such language to yourself had you not loved, did you not still love, Jesus passionately, although unaware of it? Your love has gone from you, your conscious love. Yes, this is true. Yet of your hidden love Jesus is well aware. He perceives it with growing happiness. Your love has gone from you, the love which brought you delight, which brought you joy. Yes, this is true. Yet you have a love as good, if not better, a sorrowful love, an ardent, though hidden love, a love that fills you with sorrowful aspiration towards your beloved. For as there is the joy born of love, so there is the suffering born of love. Of the latter you have now to drink deep. As in days gone by love brought you joy, so now it brings you suffering. This last lot is surely the better far, the more to be preferred of a heart that loving itself no longer loves Jesus purely. And further, though you suspect it not, God is slowly instilling into you a vast love of esteem. He is giving you perception of your own repulsiveness, and so also in a way as secret as it is mysterious, of his divine lovableness. Soon the dawn will break, then shall this love of esteem awake you to raptures that now you cannot suspect. A footnote. It is this secret love of esteem that causes the soul, which is plunged in the night of the spirit at any cost to prefer the will of Jesus to any of its own personal desires. Can this be torpor? To continue, there is none who is able to bring you perfect solace. One thought, however, there is that, if God will, can give you great courage and can buoy up your trust till light return. You are convinced, or all but convinced, that instead of advancing you are going backwards in the love of God and in the way of perfection. For this you reproach yourself. Yet for this has Jesus ever reproached you? Have you clear perception of any well-defined voluntary fault, of any notable infidelity? Doubtless the answer is no. You see your own unworthiness, vaguely you perceive your repulsiveness, your apathy, and your innumerable, more or less involuntary imperfections. Yet of any real or grave fault you are unable to make discovery. You surely cannot think that Jesus would allow you to go astray for anything falling short of serious infidelity. He who so greatly desires your love and your holiness, shall he abandon you to mediocrity on account of faults due to weakness or to inadvertence that he must expect on your part? Were you to lapse into a serious fault, would you not reproach yourself for this very vigorously and very wholeheartedly? Would he then leave you without a word, without a good-bye said, 
and so deprive you forever of his supreme graces? Jesus has made you no bitter reproaches. Far from it. It is true that when lulls come in the storm, he does not return to give you the comforting sense of his presence. Yet, nevertheless, you are aware that he's not far off. You surmise it. Now surely it is to peace to surrender to himself that he invites you instead of to the severe reprimand of your expectation. In these hours of glimmering light, when the night grows less black and faint gleams flicker through the darkness, cling to your belief. Hold fast to your salutary yearnings for trust, for these are the voice of Jesus which whispers murmuringly, It is I, be not afraid. Take note of this. It is often characteristic of the night of the senses, and far more especially so of the night of the spirit. The soul has a vivid perception of its misery and its unworthiness, but it has no clear conviction of any outstanding fault deliberately committed, or of any serious lack of generosity that would justify its loss of divine graces. Consequently, Jesus does not cast any serious reproach upon it, or give it the conviction that for this fault or the other it has incurred his displeasure. Just as it has a general sense of its own unworthiness, though it can recall no grave failing, so in the night of the soul, above all, it has a clear impression that in some obscure manner it has displeased God. These suggestive words of St. Augustine have particular application at this juncture. O God, you pursue those who flee from you, and you flee from those who pursue you. This is precisely the experience of the soul. It has given God cause for discontent. Upon the soul he turns his back. It no longer pleases him. Its repulsiveness alone accounts for his displeasure. God no longer loves it, and it no longer loves God. This impression follows upon the changes which we've already noted in the soul, the loss of conscious love, its own apparent inactivity, the frightening spectacle of its repulsiveness. How poor and pitiable beggar that it is, can it draw near to the great king? Can it speak to him of love, still less of that divine union of which it fondly dreams? Moreover, in the night of the spirit, God himself, by his divine action upon the soul, still more intensifies this fear, this anxiety of love. Deliberately, he makes it believe that it has given him displeasure. To stimulate its love, he hides himself, sure that the soul will make response with ardent aspirations, with violent love pangs, with despairing appeals, that without its knowledge give great pleasure to God. A comparison from St. John of the Cross. Let hours of consolation be remembered. Hitherto we have scarcely touched upon those other ordeals that during these nights God often sends that he may intensify his work of purification. When the soul is in the grip of desolation, half distracted and given over to anxiety, God sends contradictions persecutions, infidelities on the part of its friends, humiliations at the hands of its superiors, or often sickness that stretches it upon a bed of pain. Almost invariably, too, strong temptations assail it from time to time. It is obvious, therefore, how greatly the soul which passes through the crucible of such tribulations needs to encourage itself and to incite itself to trust. How greatly it stands in need of its director's stimulating advice. Let it then remind itself of the purpose of these sufferings. Let it think of that union with God of which it is so desirous, and which upon a day yet to come shall be its victor's crown after similar struggles. The noble conception which it has of God, its beloved, must surely bring it to love all which rids it of its blemishes and of its imperfections, and so prepares it for ultimate union. 
None is written more graphically than St. John of the Cross, of the Knight of the Senses and of the Spirit. In his famous Dark Knight, this great mystical teacher has a fine comparison that he develops at length, recollection of which will help us to endure these purifying sufferings and to increase our love for them, since their purpose is to remove every stumbling block from that union with God so greatly desired by our soul. In the night of the senses, as in that of the spirit, the fire both of divine love and of infused contemplation, St. John says, works upon the soul to transform it into God, even as the more material fire works upon the wood which it seeks to transform into flame. It begins by drying it and ejecting its sap from it. Subsequently, it blackens it, leaves it shapeless, charred, and evil-smelling. In this way, it extracts and renders palpable all those crude and hidden constituents which impeded the fire's action. Lastly, it sets it on fire and quickly converts it into such shining light and warmth that the wood seems to be transformed into fire itself. Just so the fire of loving contemplation before it affects the soul's transformation and union with itself, rids it of all its impurities. It purges all evil inclinations from it, blackens its vanity and chars its egoism, till soon it seems much more repulsive and much more imperfect than it was before. The wretched soul with tears laments its unhappy lot. It ought, on the contrary, to be full of rejoicing, at the thought that this same seemingly cruel fire of obscure and loving contemplation makes it suffer only on account of its own impurities and imperfections. When once it's been sufficiently purified, this same fire of contemplation kindles it anew in so sweet and delightful a fashion that it forgets all its past travail and surpassingly rejoices at these salutary sufferings which by slow degrees have transformed it into a living flame of divine love. Then, too, the recollection of graces received in former days, do we but know how to make good use of it, can be a precious solace to us. We shall then remember those delightful days in which God, Jesus, and Mary surpassingly bestowed upon us every kind of tenderness, keeping us with loving caresses. It was then, in this world's night, that precious flashes of insight unveiled for us the mysterious realities of the world beyond. God and Our Lady desired here upon this earth to give us a glimpse of this great love that they have for us. The glimpsed glory fled. Night in its blackness closed round us once more. While invisible though they had become, all things revealed by those flashes of insight continued yet to be, for they are the faithful reflection of the love of God and of Mary alike. Glimpsed for a moment of time by the eyes of our soul, the fact of them remains, though we neither perceive it nor are conscious of it. Now and forever they love us with the same tenderness, with that unutterable tenderness which brought us rapture when first we were aware of it. It is good indeed to reflect upon this and the grace implicit in it. For these flashes of insight have made us understand, to a certain extent experimentally, those great truths that lie beyond the senses. What consolation and what a source of trust it is to reflect that even in our night when all things appear changed, all things in fact continue to be as they were before. Moreover, this is true of our own love that we have for God. Temporarily we believe that we love God no longer. Formerly, when flashes of divine revelation illumined our soul, love kindled our heart to flame. By this means God gave us greater understanding and more vivid realization of those supernatural and suprasensible virtues that are the true life of our soul. These flashes have fled to be followed by darkness. Yet this tender love for Jesus and all these supernatural virtues continue to exist, to thrill through our being in secret 
and suprasensible fashion. This thought is indeed well calculated to fill our hearts with joy and with trusting tenderness for God. Jesus, who in us relives his passion, the soul's recollection of the long night of the senses, from which it has happily issued in the past and from which it has derived so many benefits, can be of considerable help to it when it is plunged into the terrible night of the spirit. For there is a marked parallel between these two nights. Do you then reflect from time to time, O hapless soul, upon that initial ordeal? For just as now, so then, you were afraid. You were in utter doubt. Yet an unassailable trust was your stay, until light came and the darkness fled. Remember then those graces that came with the new day. Remember the dear presence of Jesus restored to you. Remember his tenderness grown even greater than before. The new ordeal is as the old, but more torturing than the old. It is essential that all things die in you, that God may perfectly live in you. As of old, so now the dawn shall break, for God will have completed his work. Trust then in him. So far he has led you, he will not forsake you now that you draw near to perfection of holiness. Later, in the night of the Spirit, remember that long ago in self-surrender you became the plaything of Jesus. You made surrender to him of all your being, that he might live in you in the stead of your repulsive self. You renounced life's joy, that in you and through you he might rejoice according to the dictates of his good pleasure. Surely, then, you need not be amazed at the extent of your suffering. For has not this Jesus, who lives in you, and with whom you strive to identify yourself, a great hunger for suffering? And is it not his aim, by suffering in you and through you, to sate his hunger? There's no doubt of it. The desire of Jesus is to suffer in you and through you. As the great apostle declared, you shall fill up in yourself that which was lacking in the passion of Christ. It is his will in you to live again his dolorous passion. By this ordeal of your soul's night he does indeed effect this. In you and through you he relives his bitter anguish of Gethsemane. He relives the travail and the agony of his love. In you once again, when the last hour comes, and the darkness descends, he cries aloud, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Be of good courage. Do not falter in your obdurate trust. Like Jesus, in the last agony you shall die upon the cross, yet in you Jesus shall come to resurrection. Dawn shall break in glory. Christ shall revive in you the unutterable joy and delight of his glorified humanity. He shall fill you, while still upon this earth, with the ecstatic raptures of his divinity. Chapter 17 Trust in Temptation The various kinds of temptation, temptations directed against purity, these above all call for great trust. Temptations are to be counted among the most sorrowful and most torturing trials that beset every generous soul in this life. To the loving soul these trials bring pain indeed, making it doubt its very love. They seem to bring evil very near to it. They seem to make its fear increase with its increasing horror of them. There are times when it might be said, that evil brushes the soul with its sinister wings. Moreover, these temptations are infinitely varied. They include temptations against the theological virtue of faith, induced by the devil, or merely suggested by the materialistic atmosphere which surrounds us. Temptations, too, against the theological virtue of hope. Temptations of spiritual weariness and of discouragement. In the interior life we used to be so fervent, in the way of the commandments and of the counsels of God we walked so joyously, 
that we thought to attain to holiness in a short time indeed. Yet, if we glanced backwards over the long years of our life, we seem to have covered little ground. Plainly, holiness is not for us. We shall never attain, it would seem, to that ideal of our cherished dreams. There are temptations against the theological virtue of charity, those temptations of various kinds that strive to win our heart, to detach it from God and to attach it to material and ephemeral things. Again, there are the many temptations directed against the moral virtues. Among these, there is one in a class apart which needs to be discussed at length. For alas, whether saints or sinners, we are all exposed to its assaults. This is the temptations against purity. Few indeed are the souls so far privileged that like Teresa of the child Jesus, they have never known the revolt of the flesh. From time to time, many generous souls are summoned to pass through the crucible of this ordeal, while God, who disposes of all things according to the dictates of his inscrutable wisdom, allows even these souls, who are destined to the highest holiness, to flinch beneath the fierce assaults of these temptations. The infinite variety of these temptations makes them as insidious as they are painful. Often they assume such insinuating and beguiling shapes, they so skillfully bewitch our imagination and our senses, that resistance to their seductive delight seems impossible. Equally, there are times when they attack us directly. This attack is made so fiercely and so impetuously that we are forsaken, it seems, by God and abandoned to our human weakness. We are about to lay down our arms when the unhoped for reinforcement of a powerful grace carries us on to final victory. For this battle, we need to be armed with every weapon at the Christian's disposal, and in particular, with an immense trust. Even from the psychological point of view, trust and the courage which it engenders are essential for these terrible struggles against the demon of impurity. What can that soldier do who in the midst of the battle has been seized by fear and discouragement? He's doomed in advance to defeat and to death. If, relying upon our unaided strength, or more precisely, upon our unaided human weakness, we begin with the boding sense that we're unable to resist the attacks of the vice of impurity, we shall offer it only a weak and a very brief resistance. At all costs, relying upon God, we need to place all our hope in His grace, whatever our experiences of the past may have been. We need to be convinced that our indomitable will is, with grace, capable of resisting every effort made by the enemy. Then, and only then, shall we have, even where natural things are concerned, a chance of making victory ours. Above all, from the supernatural point of view, trust, pure trust in none but God, is essential to us. For without it, in this dangerous strife, we shall certainly not go far. Trust in God is our indispensable buckler, without which we shall quickly succumb to the poison darts of the enemy. Fortunately, though, we have great need to fear, even to despair, on our own account at the thoughts of this poor soul of ours imprisoned in our bestial body, when we look to God our hope is greater than our need. Whatever be our weakness, whatever be our past experiences, when we raise our eyes to the holy hill whence cometh our help, trust springs spontaneously within us. Reasons for trusting God, His goodness, purity, holiness, and beauty. God's love for Jesus, our mystical head. All of God seems to cry to us, Be of good courage, my child. Be firm in your trust. The vast goodness of God shall surely have compassion on us when agonized and all but demented by the fury of the attack, we run to that goodness like frightened children seeking sanctuary in the arms of our mother. 
How shall this super maternal goodness of God fail to come to our aid? How should it abandon us, indifferent and unmoved, a prey to the fury of the demon, our mortal enemy? No great stress, it would seem, need to be laid upon this, however excellent it be as a subject for meditation, for this appears self-evident. What is less evident, and only too little known, is that the divine attributes, which seem calculated to inspire us with fear, are, in these struggles for chastity, unfailing sources of trust. The purity of God seems at first sight to be designed to terrify us. Is it not said that the very angels are not without blemish in the eyes of the infinite purity of God? In God's eyes there's nothing spotless upon this earth. When we reflect upon our past, must we not shudder at the thought of this infinite purity? While if we be convinced of our own miserable poverty, has not the basis of this conviction to do with purity, to do with chastity? Though we be innocent of grave faults, how many are our shortcomings, how complete our failure, whether in courage or in energy, to repulse evil thoughts and impure solicitations? Must not this make us distrusting when we stand face to face with this divine purity that searches our secret soul with eyes from which none, not even the most intimate of our thoughts, can remain hidden? Truly, we have very little knowledge of this same purity of God if we envisage it as this cowardly, and I venture to say Jansenist fashion. For the soul whose virtue is tempted, there is no more sweet and encouraging a thing than the purity of God. Unhappily, there are all too few to whom this thought occurs. It cannot be denied that divine purity abhors all uncleanness, all sin, and in particular, all sin against purity. Yet, it is precisely for this reason that we are to expect from it the special grace of a perfect and immaculate purity. The reason for this is plain indeed. It is simply that the infinite purity of God is a vast love and intense wish for purity. It has an infinite desire to share its nature with all creatures. It would have all things steeped in itself, all things drowned in itself. Perpetually it sends out its purifying rays, searching for any to whom it may give greater purity. Truly its desire to behold all men in a state of purity is a surpassing desire. Though it hate every sin against purity with an immense hatred, it is filled with a vast compassion for every creature that would live a pure life. The slightest vigilance on our part, the struggle free from the mire in which we find ourselves, yet more, the least of our desires to persist in the loveliness of virtue and to preserve ourselves unspotted from the world, move it profoundly. If I, the least of God's creatures, who am filled with evil inclinations and exposed to sins against purity, stretch out my arms towards infinite purity with fervent desire and wistful supplication, it shall be beyond all my imaginings to conceive the vast and ineffable compassion which the divine purity shall evince towards me. Nothing in the world is capable of giving me this conception. This purity of God is dissolved into pity on my account, and knows no desire save to grant my petitions. The divine purity, it will be said, abhors all impurity. This cannot be denied. Yet it is precisely because it so abominates it that it has such infinite compassion upon such weakling children as we are, weakling children that it perceives to be exposed to the attacks of carnal vice. Would not a loving mother do all that she could to protect her child against infectious disease? Then shall not the purity of God, so wistful for our own and all men's purity, when it perceives the treasure of our soul's chastity about to be delivered into the power of the demon, shall the purity of God grown cruel and cold allow us to call in vain upon its aid? 
Possibly. We've shuddered at tales of impurity rife during the Great War, shuddered too at accounts of the devilish devices employed in our contemporary society, and particularly in Soviet Russia, which have the degradation of childhood as their end. Or again, we may well have been sickened at talk, overheard by us, of some libertine or the other, and his foul methods aiming at subordinating some worthy young girl of our acquaintance. What indignation surges through us! What great compassion we know for this delicate virtue of chastity, striving bravely against such repeated attacks! What would we not give to succor it? What would we not give to thwart these diabolic devices? Further, shall not God's infinite purity that so loves pure souls, that so desires to make and keep them pure, have compassion upon us, when groaning under temptation we cry beseechingly unto it? What still greater compassion it shall have for us when so many assaults of the flesh and the devil strive to violate our purity. Let us ponder this long and attentively. Let us remember it in times of spiritual ordeal. Then we shall behold our trust in this infinite purity of God, a trust hitherto unknown to us, it may well be, grown to vast proportions. How happy are the souls which have learnt to recognize and to love with an exceeding love the purity of God. In the midst of their spiritual strife forever they are at peace, and they rejoice in devoting themselves utterly to this perfect purity, certain to find there an assured sanctuary. I, too, have often been the object of the enemy's attacks. More than once I've been at my wit's end. Either I did not know, or did not sufficiently know, the purity of God, that purity which so greatly loves us, which has made Our Lady immaculate and all the saints virginal in their purity, and which should keep me virginal in my own. To this purity I too will consecrate myself. To it I will cry in trusting love, O oh, enrapturing purity of God, O oh, much beloved purity, how glad at heart I am to have come to know you at last. Let me throw myself into your arms. Let me consecrate myself to you. Let me devote myself to you, becoming your little child. As such, accept me, protecting me against my dreaded persecutors. In my heart has been born an immense trust in you. So strong is your desire to make and to keep me pure that you will preserve unspoiled that chastity which I have consecrated to you have entrusted to you, and whose containing vessel is unfortunately so fragile. O oh God, in your purity I have placed all my hope that I may be pure and may forever please you by the fact of my purity. In myself I have no hope at all, for alas, all that is in me conspires against purity. Despite my weaknesses, despite my shortcomings, my hope in you is strong. My faith is firm that all the temptations which assail me are no more than the loving devices of your infinite purity, and that with your omnipotent protection they shall ceaselessly contribute to bring my purity nearer to perfection. The purity of God comforts us and strengths our trust. His holiness and His beauty do so no less. The holiness of God is perpetually busy on our behalf, that it may have a share in its own nature and so effect our sanctification. Like a wide ocean, it is about us on every hand. Better than all, it has entered into us, has steeped us in sanctifying grace, has filled us with itself. Sanctifying grace is the treasure whose full value is appreciated by the divine holiness alone. It is a jewel of infinite price that Jesus has obtained for us at the price of his blood. This jewel, which has given us share in his divinity and has made us children of God, is the object of the solicitude and of the infinite love of God's holiness. Jealously he seeks to preserve it 
and untiringly labors to make it lovelier. Forever present in our secret soul, forever keeping vigil there, the divine holiness itself holds the citadel against the enemy's every attack. Of these attacks the most to be dreaded, as it knows well, are impure suggestions of the flesh. With what emotion, with what intense compassion, this infinite holiness of God, this holiness that so loves us who are his children, through divinization, succors us in our efforts and our struggles. God's holiness is equally well aware that if we fall wounded beneath the fire of the enemy of impurity, no quarter will be given to us. In us, sanctifying grace will come to utter ruin, the soul to utter death. There is no halfway house. In his holiness, then, let us have a boundless trust. In hours of temptation, above all, let us make it our sanctuary. It will protect us with a solicitude that is more than maternal. It will assure us of final victory. This that we have said of God's infinite holiness, we can say too of his infinite beauty, that beauty which is beyond all our imaginings, that beauty of which sanctifying grace, with the ineffable loveliness which is its gift to us, is an almost perfect reflection. This divine beauty, no less, is infinitely desirous of sharing its nature with us, and of adding an ever-increasing loveliness to our soul. To it also, in our temptations, we can hasten in utter trust that it may protect against the dread blemishes of our least lapses into impurity the celestial beauty of our soul. Even more effectually than his beauty, purity, and holiness, the love of God for his Son Jesus assures the triumph of every soul that in temptation puts its trust therein. If God loves us, it is chiefly because we are one with Jesus, because in him and of him we have our lives, because we are members of his mystical body. In us he sees his beloved Son, in whom he is well pleased. It is for this reason primarily that his watchful love guards us ceaselessly and heaps us with every kind of grace. In God's eyes, to protect against temptation every soul that has recourse to him is simply to protect Jesus. He would fail in his love for his Son were he not to take his place by our side in our struggle against the spirit of darkness. Monsignor Gay has expressed this very well in these suggestive words. It is never ourselves alone that the enemy attacks, for the primary reason that it is not ourselves alone whom he hates. The truth is that it is not ourselves chiefly that he hates and persecutes, it is Jesus Christ in us. Man is God's image, made in his likeness. We are the Father's true children, the brethren and co-heirs of the Son, temples of the Holy Ghost. We are the chosen people, priests of the King, the living body of Christ. By virtue of the love we give to God, a gift not hard to make by us who receive so much from him, we can make both joy and glory his. It is this that kindles in the evil spirit within us that threefold and unquenchable fire of jealousy, hate, and wrath, whose fiery glow shapes and sharpens the fiery darts which that evil spirit hurls at us. In every age we've known heretics, as in our own day we've seen revolutionaries possessed by a veritable frenzy, who have profaned sacred things, defiled holy images, and shattered crucifixes. That which constrained Satan to drive them to this frenzy still more strongly compels Satan himself to ill-use and corrupt us, since we are symbols of God far more expressive and far more greatly loved than those images of wood or of stone. A stronger motive for trust than this could scarcely be imagined. Whatever the fury 
the vehemence or the persistence of certain of the temptations of impurity, let us be in no wise intimidated. With a boundless trust, let us have recourse to that God whose great desire is to help us and to give us the victory, because in us he loves his Son Jesus. With so many reasons for trusting God, we should be unforgivable indeed if in the midst of these persistent temptations against chastity we allowed our courage to falter and to fail. Doubtless, when temptation is upon us, these reasons may seem to lose some of their force to minds beguiled by violent passion. Even so, our heart in its desperation will remain faithful to its love for God and with eloquence will cry unto him, though the cry be an almost unconscious cry. Particularly in times of tranquility, whether they come before or after the storm, our need to remember these consoling truths. If unhappily in the past we have chanced to commit serious offenses against the lovely virtue of chastity, let us question ourselves to discover in what we have failed, whether it were in good will or in trust. Our inherent weakness, the vehemence of our passion, our former lapses in themselves are no excuse. For if of ourselves we are unable to do anything, by fervently beseeching the help of God, who has so ineffable a love of our purity, we can do all things. In our own day, modern science has discovered new means of curing certain diseases hitherto incurable. Under the action of ultraviolet rays, children suffered from rickets or from mental deficiency can gradually be restored to normal health. Poor sufferers from spiritual rickets that we all are, pray to the flesh and its desires, it is for us to go constantly to God. It is for us to go to God's goodness, to his beauty, to his holiness. Above all, it is for us to go to God's purity. Let us go that we may bask at length beneath the healing action of his ultra-natural rays. Let us beseech him to cure our infirmities, to free our soul from its sorrowful lusts, and little by little to transform it until its cure complete it attains immaculate purity. Trust in Jesus. His ardent desires to keep us pure, especially if we be his spouses, especially if we live a life of identification with him. To strengthen our trust and with it our courage against temptations, we need to have recourse to God and to his infinite perfections. Let us now consider Jesus our Savior and Mary our Immaculate Mother. How greatly Jesus loved purity! How greatly he gave proof of his love for this blessed virtue when he lived among men! John owed it to his spotless chastity that he was the favorite disciple of the Savior, upon whose bosom he leaned during the Last Supper. How, because of their innocence, Jesus loved little children! The mere thought of offenses against this innocence made his voice poignant with his love for purity. Be he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me. It were better for him that a millstone should be hanged about his neck and that he should be drowned in the depths of the sea. We have all delighted in that episode of the Samaritan woman in which Jesus shows his ardent desire to free this poor sinner from the mire of vice. It was to snatch her from her life of degradation that he so providentially contrived the talk with her, which against Jewish custom, and to the astonishment of the apostles, he had at Jacob's well. Jesus was ardently desirous of giving back to this poor strayed sheep her former purity. How infinitely more desirous is he of protecting the chastity of those who love him, of those who have vowed all their love to him. Despite all appearances to the contrary, he will never allow us to struggle alone against the prince of darkness. The touching story of St. Catherine of Siena 
is well known. After a period during which she had suffered terrible temptations, when the storm was over, she cried to Jesus using these anguished words, quote, During this storm, where then were you, my Jesus? Unquote. To her, Jesus made loving reply, quote, I was in the midst of your heart. Unquote. To each of us, after each of our temptations, the Savior can well make the same reply. If this be true of all of us who love Jesus and who seek to make our will his own, then it is still more true of his privileged, those who are his monks and his nuns. His care to protect them against all impurity is a jealous care. In his care for them, they are as the apple of his eye. He, the loving spouse, par excellence, who loves his spouses as never man has been loved on earth, will surely not permit them to be outdone in fidelity and responsive love by the merely human spouses of this earth. He will surely do everything, everything. He will place his omnipotence at the disposal of his beloved spouse. He will surely protect his spouse against the greatest of all misfortunes, a lapse into the mire of shameful sin, in so far as it needs a single word on his part to deliver that spouse. When temptation leaves us in agony and in giddiness of soul, let us reflect upon the love of Jesus, our spouse. What loving husband on this earth can look with indifference upon the cursed maneuvers of the seducer who seeks to drag his bride into evil doing? How his heart is roused to wrath, how he is ready to do everything, to attempt everything, so only he may protect the innocence and the faithful love of his spouse from such corrupting practices. Equally, Jesus will not fail us. He will surely not allow us to succumb beneath the assault of those infamous seducers, the flesh and the devil. For his burning desire is to safeguard our innocence and our chastity. We can be sure of this. If there be agonized hours in which he appears to forsake us, it is no more than appearance. He hides himself that he may have better proof of our love because for his spouse he has infinite compassion. He knows ecstasies of joy and of happiness in seeing her struggle for faithfulness' sake, in hearing her cries of distress which themselves call forth his love. Invisibly and in secret he keeps us clasped tight to his bosom in an embrace that, unfelt though it be, is not the less loving or the less real. At such times, when our torment is at its height, it is good to take the crucifix and, kissing it with love, to look upon Jesus dying for us upon the cross. Let us make protestation of this love to Jesus. Let us say to him, Ah, Jesus, it is I who have been the cause of your sufferings. Better for me to die a hundred deaths than that I should again crucify you by mortal sin better that I should die than that I should again grieve you by the slightest voluntary shortcoming, better that I should die. Yet, O oh Jesus, you know how utterly weak I am. Often I seem about to succumb to evil suggestions. You who so greatly desire my love and my purity, you who have done and endured all things to make purity mine, save me by your all-powerful grace. Do you above all, O small band of the elect, souls chosen from among those consecrated and religious souls who not merely live in close intimacy with Jesus, but who have heard his call to perfect intimacy and the life of identification with him, it is for you to experience surpassing joy and glad-heartedness in the midst of your tribulation as did the great apostle, who cried, You too rejoice. In you Jesus would live again his life of ineffable purity. He has chosen you that in you he may relive all his virtues, that in you also he may once more make manifest his perfect charity. Let courage be yours, courage and trust. 
It is he himself who wages in you a great fight for purity. It is his divine chastity that he would make shine forth from you, there in his heaven among the angels and the saints. He is aware that in you is this chastity may only come to full perfection in the midst of strife. It needs temptations, as strong as they are urgent, to make plain to all the celestial court the chaste and faithful love which you know for Jesus. Let great happiness possess you, for each assault of temptation makes your purity and your love wax in you. What greater consolation could you have than that? When temptation is at its worst, Cry aloud to your Jesus who seems to sleep in the bark of your heart. Say to him, Lord, save us, we perish. And Jesus will arise and will master the angry waves, so that soon the great lake of your soul will return to its tranquil serenity. Better still, from time to time say to Jesus, My beloved, it rests with you. Now it is for you to act. At this hour I feel myself to be utterly weak. Do you then demonstrate your power that is mine no less than yours? O Jesus, live in me your purity, in me shed forth your chastity. Afterwards, in a few hours it may be, Jesus, the host of our tabernacles, will come in communion to visit me. Then I shall discover my wounds to him, I shall show him, my festering sores. I shall show him this dread cancer of impurity that mortal sin has produced in me, and that afflicts me with so much agony. With loving fervor close to my bosom, I shall clasp this Jesus, who is infinite purity, my soul's radium, the unique remedy which can cure my infirmity. At each such communion I shall press his heart against my own. I shall beseech him to cure my soul. Imperceptibly he will transform me. Miraculously he will cure the incurable cancer of my innate impurity. Trust in Mary. Every soul wistful of perfection is aware that it can have no better protectress than Mary, its immaculate mother. From the earliest years of Christianity until our own age, how many souls have prostrated themselves at her feet to find in her a buckler for their purity? Thanks to her, how many have become notable for their perfect purity, at times going to the length of sealing with their blood their promise of inviolable fidelity to Jesus. Is there anyone who better than Mary can aid us in these agonizing struggles? She who from the day of her son's conception has bruised the head of the serpent and whose utter purity has been the supreme achievement of God's omnipotence, she whose purity surpasses that of the seraphim themselves, is indeed fitted to fight at our side in company with her son Jesus. Not once, but many times, let us ask of her purity, purity from all sin, and in particular purity from all offense against the lovely virtue of chastity. Not once, but many times, let us cry, O Mary, I, your beloved child, desire above all things to be a little like you, pure and immaculate as you are. You know well my native misery. You know how often I am beset by these evil suggestions that assail me. Help me to be pure and to remain pure. If I must pass through temptation's fire, grant that I may never succumb to it. Grant that my purity, passing through the crucible of these agonizing ordeals, shall emerge a little more refined on each occasion. When the torture of temptation seems unendurable in its ferocity, let us go like small children frightened by that savage dog which is the devil, to take refuge in Mary's arms, crying, O Mary, save me, for I am spent. Then Mary shall lift us in her arms, and we shall be safe from the pursuit of that diabolical beast. In these struggles let us then have a boundless trust in Jesus and in Mary. So shall nothing be able to work us harm. 
There will be times when we shall know giddiness at the sight of the yawning abyss of impurity open at our feet, ready to engulf us. To us it seems that we are a hair's breadth from a fatal fall. In reality, if we but have complete trust in Jesus and in Mary our Mother, Queen of Virgins, our safety is assured. When our agony is at its worst, between the abyss and ourselves, there is the most formidable of barriers. There is the love of Jesus, our sole spouse, and all the love of Mary, our most loving mother. Let us understand the part which temptations play, a means of increasing a particular virtue attacked, as opportunities for fervent love, for sufferings, and so on. To be bolder and still more trusting in the strife against temptation, we need to understand thoroughly the part which temptations play. For generous souls, they are the divine and providential means to make us still more expert in this virtue or that. The saying of St. Teresa will be remembered. Towards the end of her life she came to suffer frightfully at temptations against the faith. Yet she understood the purpose of these trials, and she cried happily, in these few months past I have made more acts of faith than during the whole of my life. It is by the repeated conquest of temptation and by generosity of soul that a man becomes notable for this virtue or the other. Assuredly it is this that should be our comfort in our temptations, frequent though they may possibly be against chastity. There are times when, though we have no knowledge of any voluntary fault, we are somewhat disposed to think that their length and their intensity are a bad sign. Let us be comforted. Often the physical state of this body of clay, in which our soul is a prisoner, is sufficient to explain the strife. Yet apart from this, God allows these repeated ordeals that unknown to us, our chastity may be made marvelously more beautiful. Do we but remain faithful and generous? Do we but decide never to come to terms with the enemy, whatever the cost? Do we but determine to deny him even the smallest satisfaction, our purity will grow in a miraculous way. Each temptation overcome increases this dear and precious virtue by the mere fact that it needs painful and often heroic effort. Each attack repulsed, each evil thought repelled, God knows if there be any such in our life, is one new jewel in our crown of virginity. We do not think sufficiently upon this comforting aspect of temptation. We need to make ourselves familiar with this thought if we are to have the full benefit of it. Only then will temptations become dear to us, eventually seeming so precious that we shall seldom be inclined to ask that they may be removed. Temptations against purity make our souls the purer. Little by little, they shape that rough diamond, our crude and relative purity, until they make of it a sparkling jewel that delights the heart of Jesus, our spouse. Yet, a thing that is as dear to loving hearts, temptations are also so many opportunities for fervent love. Particularly, this is true for priests, for monks, for nuns, for all those who've taken the vow of chastity. In temptations against purity, it is our fidelity as spouses of Jesus which is at stake. It is the devil's frank desire to ruin our love and our fidelity. It is a challenge that he delivers to our love. Then does the courageous soul make answer to Satan, as did that charming virgin of Rome, St. Agnes, Get thee behind me, Satan, what wouldst thou of me? I have a betrothed already who loves me and whom I love. My betrothed who has my troth is he whom the angels serve and whose beauty is admired of the stars in heaven. I love Christ who was born of a virgin mother and a virgin God. When I love him, I am chaste. When I caress him, I am pure. And when I take him for spouse, my chastity is but the more chaste. 
at each temptation, against purity, at each evil thought or evil desire, Jesus seems to put this question to us. Do you still love me? Have you come to regret that you have given yourself to be my spouse? Do you regret that once and for all you have sacrificed the joys of the flesh? Each temptation provokes but the one answer, however unconsciously made, that answer which is the soul's renewal of its vow of chastity when it cries to Jesus, I have given you all, now and forever I have given you all. In this, what countless acts of love are implied. Doubtless they're not always reflex and conscious acts of love. Often they are but direct acts of love. Yet, though this be so, they are not less dear to the heart of their royal spouse. We shall have still better understanding of the great value of temptations against chastity if we but think of the extent to which they arouse generosity and mortification. For souls wistful of suffering, in a certain sense they are more than precious. Ah, the suffering which they sometimes bring! There are times when they are a veritable torture, a true martyrdom of love. A soul frequently tempted in regard to purity once wrote, Jesus has once more made me aware that temptations against chastity were a joy for him and that I must indeed be glad of heart to be able to please him thus. It seemed that he said to me, Behold, how many and how increasing are your opportunities to give me pleasure, since latterly you are almost uninterruptedly tempted with each new moment you can deny yourself and so offer me a precious sacrifice. But if you but make a mortification, if you but deprive yourself of some particular enjoyment, of some ardent desire, are you not doing something that shall delight my heart? Indeed, there is scarcely anything that can be compared in its virulence to these diabolical suggestions. Hard though it be to surrender one's intense desires, one's own will, to that of others, it is still harder to resist these solicitations of the flesh, solicitations so strong and so deep that they seem to impregnate all one's being and to rob one of all one's vitality. Truly these temptations afford excellent, nay incomparable opportunities for suffering and for self-denial, and this not once only, but on countless occasions. If we are to succeed in loving God with a pure love, we must succeed in hating the self with an implacable hatred in having a righteous horror of it. In this respect, too, temptations against purity are excellent. They enable us to express a holy disgust of this repulsive self and a fervent love of the beauty of God. At the same time, they bestow on us that true humility which St. Augustine has so well defined as that love of God which is based upon scorn of self.